Good evening, everyone. My name is Marianne Baer, and I serve as a board member of the World Wisdoms Project. We warmly welcome you from wherever you might be viewing us tonight to our second event for the year entitled, You Do What? Spiritual Practice in Times of Crisis, Part One. We chose our theme very carefully this past summer because we are beginning to realize that crisis kinds of moments, while extremely tragic, can often offer incredible and easily lost insights. Think of how many of us noticed early on in COVID times, the unequal statistics befalling minority communities, and then the tragic events surrounding a resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement viscerally reminded us once again of the racial inequities still present in our nation. Maybe some of these deeper insights were clarified because we were leading a much slower pace of life. Stay at home and safer at home did that to us. Inadvertently, we were living an ancient spiritual practice of quiet reflection, and it was giving us new eyes to see. Last month, we were happy to share the journeys of four very different people in our first presentation for this particular series. Initially, they shared their concrete and very beautiful beneficial contributions they had made to these communities in Northern Colorado, but then they also shared their very specific and unique spiritual practices that led to those contributions. So tonight, we will begin to share a broad palette of other possible practices from faith and belief communities here in Northern Colorado. Succeeding sessions will enhance that variety. Hopefully these presentations might possibly offer insights into further ways for the development of those new eyes needed to see and be strengthened for the challenges and possible contributions we can make ahead. But before we move into tonight's presentation, I'd like to share just a few things. This event and many other events that World Wisdoms presents are offered at no cost to you, the attendees. This reflects our desire to create spaces that are accessible for all to attend. However, as a 501c3 nonprofit organization, we rely totally on the generosity of donors to support our work and help us to advance our mission here in Northern Colorado. These events do require money to be produced. If you're able to give a donation of any kind, you know, please, that it will be most appreciated. We'll provide links after this presentation to securely make those donations, should you wish. Please remember, as a nonprofit, a donation to World Wisdoms is tax deductible. To our past, present, and future donors, we relay a huge thanks. You are helping to ensure our contribution and our continuation beyond this year. Secondly, Two weeks from tonight, December 2nd, our board member, Rabbi Halal Katsir, along with volunteer Mary McDonald, will be hosting a virtual discussion group to collective, collectively reflect on tonight's presentation. We hope you can join us. Again, we'll provide a link for the registration for that event at the end of our sessions tonight. Finally, I would like to thank Rabbi Halal and Cassie Ponsolo for collaboration in the planning of tonight's presentation. I will now hand the mic over to Amy who will give a few contributions about Zoom viewing. And then we will hand the mic officially to Cassie. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, if you've been with us for one of our previous events, um, you'll notice that things look just a little bit different. We're using a Zoom webinar tonight instead of a meeting. And so the two things that that really means for you listening um, wherever you are is that we don't see or hear you if you're out in the audience. Um, you just get to sit back and enjoy our presentation tonight. And when we get to the Q&A portion of the evening, um, you should notice down at the bottom of your Zoom window that there is a button that says Q&A. Um, that's separate than the chat. We've used the chat function before for questions, um, but tonight what we would like you to do is click on that Q&A button 
and then a window will come up where you will be able to type your questions. You'll also notice once we get some questions in there that each question will have a little thumbs up icon beneath it. So if you have that same question um, or if you also really want to know the answer to that question, you can click that thumbs up button and um, that will move the question higher up on our list. So that's an easy way um, for you to see what other questions are being asked, to see what similarities and differences are out there. And we will do our best um, to answer as many questions as possible when we get to that portion of the evening. And that is really all you need to know um, for this Zoom session. So please enjoy our presentation. And I will now welcome Cassie to come on. Thank you, Marianne and Amy. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you this evening as we begin the first of our two-part series, which will focus on spiritual practices um, that can possibly be sustaining in these moments of crisis. Consider the journey that we have been on these last eight to nine months. COVID, social inequities, political tension, and most recently for those of us in Northern Colorado, fire and all that that experience brought for so many. The Facebook memes about 2020, though very entertaining, cannot possibly capture it all. Very possibly, each of us has also experienced the need to turn somewhere for strength, perspective, clearer understanding of the deeper meaning and action. Many of us have personally searched for specific ways to regain equilibrium, to keep calm, to carry on. Renewed or rediscovered spiritual practice, very broadly defined, may be one of the ways that you've been able to survive and maybe even thrive in this present moment. We might attempt a simple definition of spiritual practice as any regular intentional activity that establishes, develops, or nourishes our inner transformative resources. For some, this may be a personal relationship with the divine. For others, it may be a profound awareness or connection with the unifying principle or principles of life and being. But no matter our faith tradition, our great spiritual leaders from the past have always urged us to not only search inwardly, but to also look outwardly, love God, be still and know, breathe in and breathe out, while at the same time saying love one another and treat one another as you would want to be treated. Spiritual practice, broadly understood, focuses attention close to home, but also towards larger community. Spiritual practice, most holistically understood, can involve both quiet and action. Tonight, I'll be asking each of our panelists to share for about 10 minutes some specific spiritual practices that flow from their particular faith tradition, and also the spiritual practices they personally find most meaningful in times of crises. We'll then ask the panelists to engage in a conversation with one another for about 15 minutes about any commonalities or further questions that they may have discovered in this process. Finally, we will ask you as our World Wisdoms Project community to submit any questions or observations that you may have via that Q&A feature in this webinar. So now let us turn to our first panelist, the Reverend Jane Ann Ferguson. She's an associate minister at Plymouth Congregational Church in Fort Collins. She served in various pastoral positions across Colorado and yet still finds time to be a storyteller, writer, and frequent contributor to various biblical media resources. Thanks so much for joining us tonight, Reverend Jane Ann. There we go. Thank you so much. Um, and I just did the wonderful Zoom thing we all do and started talking while I was muted. It's great to be with you all this evening uh, here from my little basement study. Um, I feel particularly close to World Wisdoms 
because when we are all allowed to meet together, um, World Wisdoms Project uh, meets uh, in, at Plymouth Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. And that is such um, a blessing for our community and often has their programs there. So thank you for asking me to be a part of this. I came to ministry uh, in the middle of my life in my 40s to professional ministry um, from a love of the arts. I was an actress and a storyteller and I loved helping people make meaning, find meaning for their lives in, um, in literature. Uh, secular literature, of course, all kinds are rich heritage of literature, as well as biblical literature. I was steeped in bitter, biblical literature growing up in a family of faith. And so um, story came naturally with me. I was not only steeped in bi Bible, but also in, as you know, Winnie the Pooh and all the great children's books and uh, so story has always been a part of my life, a very important part. And I came to understand that I made meaning for myself through performance and interaction with story, whether it was in theater or performance of poetry or prose, um, and learned about myself and my own spiritual journey and offered that opportunity to others in that way. It was a way of being connected to me and a way of being connected to, um, to others. So that led me into ministry. As I said, I was always steeped in story and steeped in the Christian stories of the Bible. Um, and I, didn't connect it, the Bible, to other stories until I was much older. You know, you had the Bible, and you did that at church, and you tried to be a good Christian and follow God and God's ways, and then you had this whole other world of literature. I read lots of Greek myths and Roman myths and um, lots of fairy tales and all the Oz books, but when I was about 10 years old, I found C.S. Lewis um, and the books of uh, his Narnia Chronicles um, on the book table in my fourth grade classroom. They had just been published in the US. And after I read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, I went to my mom and I said, wow, this is the story of Jesus, except for it's about a lion and all the disciples are kids. And that's all, that was my great awakening there. And then I left that and went on. And it wasn't until my thirties when I was really into storytelling that I realized that those books had connected me to my imagination in ways that the Bible had not. No one had said to me, use your imagination, Jane, with the Bible. It was more like, learn the Bible, do what it says. No one had connected me um, spiritually either in the 60s, growing up in not a fundamentalist home, but in a conservative Christian home. No one had connected me to the feminine face of God in story or theology or song or sermon in any way. But it was in my 30s that I discovered that even though I had a very benevolent image in my mind of God, he was not enough. When I was 30, I gave birth to my first child and I had planned this beautiful birth, you know, with all the natural stuff stuff but you know just like giving your plans to god if you make a plan for your birth ha 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 um doesn't always work out that way i had a c-section and there was something in me that had a great sorrow and grief over that even though i had this beautiful baby boy 
And when I was trying to pray, I thought, I can't talk to God about this because he will not understand. And then a light bulb went on and I thought, mm, there's an issue there. I need a bigger image of God. And that propelled me in my early 30s into reading about the feminine face of God, to reading about the goddess, to reading um, Carol Christ and um, Judith Plaskow and um, all kinds of feminist um, authors about and feminist theology along the story then drove me into seminary by the time I was in my early 40s. So this need to have a feminine face of God and to have stories told about that and this need to use story to find meaning through the imagery of story. These are profound spiritual practices that have sustained me throughout much of my life. <clears throat> Almost all of it. You know, looking back at Narnia, I was amazed and I was taken in because two of the disciples of Aslan, if you know that story, are, are girls. And they're two important characters in the book. Unlike the Gospels, where you never hear much about women being a disciple of Jesus. What is it about story that sustains me and that leads me into um, it, it, leads me into a spiritual practice with it. Well, I discovered that when I studied with a storyteller named Robert Wilhelm, Robert Bela Wilhelm. He um, was a Catholic lay theologian and on the forefront of the storytelling movement in the 70s, the national storytelling movement. And um, you may not have known there was one, but there was with festivals popping up and it, it has morphed into all kinds of things, such as the moth stories on uh, NPR. Um, I did an apprenticeship with him in my late 30s, and it was in sacred storytelling. And we studied stories of all faith traditions, uh, Sufi stories, Buddhist stories, Jewish stories, Hasidic stories. Um, and we studied folk tales to discover what the imagery in them, what the sacred imagery was there in those folk tales. So here's kind of how a story might work for me in that. Um, I learned that when we listen to stories, we listen at different levels. And this was this is the sacred practice, the spiritual practice. If I was to tell you a story, I have a very short story and I can't even tell you all of it tonight, but it goes something like this. Um, once there was a girl who lived in a cottage at the edge of a wood and all summer long and all fall, she would gather wood for the long winter and she would chop wood and stack it around the edges of her cabin. And when the winter came and the snows grew higher, those piles of woods, wood grew, grew smaller. One spring, she discovered, while it was still cold and way before the warm weather would come, that there was not much wood left. So she went out into the forest to gather more wood to make it till the warm weather came. And as she was coming home with a big sack of wood on her back, it was so cold she stopped to make a fire in a clearing. And as she was clearing away the brush to get to the dirt, she found a small golden key. Well, that is a very rushed beginning to that small folk tale. But if you think back over it, I want you to think about what are the images that you saw or heard or tasted or smelled the fire burning, did you smell that? 
Did you feel the cold? Did you see the wood growing shorter and the snow piling higher? And those images will lead us to emotions. What did you feel? Did you feel some anxiety for her as the wood pile grew lower? Did you feel some excitement when she discovered that key? And what did that look like in your mind's eye? Did it connect with a key in your life? We listen first at the level of image when we hear story, when we even read poetry. And then we listen at the level of emotion. The images lead us to connect inside with our emotions, with our soul. And then we listen at the level of meaning. Children know how to do this. They listen to meaning and uh, to, to images, and then they listen to stories, um, to emotions, and then they go to meaning. And it's that process of story listening and that has sustained me on my journey and has sustained me as I found the feminine face of God in folk tales across the world. You know, Teresa of Avila talks about the interior castle where our soul lives. And when I go to that place, it's more like a little hobbit house with a storyteller there. And in these times of crisis, I have found that images from stories, from biblical stories, the stories of Jacob wrestling with the angels, Jesus healing stories, have been the stories that sustain my soul and sustain that soul that I go and sit with when times are really, really tough. So that's me, a storyteller, searching for the feminine face of God, which I have found as Jesus healed the woman with the flow of blood, as I've told the story of Queen Esther. It is story along with God's feminine, the Holy's feminine wisdom that sustains me in these times. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Jane Ann. That was beautiful. Gosh, it's yeah, just powerful to reflect on that. So thank you. I want to welcome our next uh, speaker. Uh, Rabbi Hillel Ketzir has uh, served Jew Jewish communities in Iowa, Maine, and Colorado since 2001. After living in Israel for nine years, he practiced law for 15 years before becoming a rabbi. He and his partner, uh, Nina Rubin, are the spiritual leaders of Congregation Bene Butte in Cresta Butte, Colorado. His passion is working through teaching and community involvement to bring people together across religious lines and other lines uh, that separate us. So thank you for being with us, uh, Rabbi Hillel, and welcome. Thank you, Cassie. Welcome everyone. Very happy that you've joined us for this conversation this evening. I am a rabbi and so one of the places that I look for spiritual practice in these times of crises is in the Jewish tradition. It's been said that we live, the, the Jewish people live a great deal in our history. And I look at our history going back to uh, the books of the Bible uh, and all of the history since. And one of the things that helps me maintain perspective on what's going on today is we've been there before. We have been through times that were worse than this. Um, and we've survived as a people. Individuals haven't always, but we as a people have survived. And as a result of our surviving, we have been able to continue our witnessing of the presence of God in the world, uh, wherever we have gone, wherever we have lived, and whatever we have gone through. We also live in our texts. 
in our scriptures. One of those scriptures is called the Talmud. It's a massive uh, commentary on the Hebrew Bible. And there are two things from that that have stood me in good stead in these recent difficult times. The first is what we refer to by the first word in, it, uh, in the Hebrew, the Shema, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad, which is usually translated as, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. Well, that last word, Echad, can be translated alone. It can be translated as one, meaning God is one. And when that verse, which is from the book of Deuteronomy, was originally written, it was probably to some extent a, a statement of arithmetic. Our neighbors had many gods, we had only one. Today, we live amongst other monotheists, many people who believe in a God. I believe it's the same God that we look to. And so that word echad, the, the oneness of God, I think means more than just the arithmetic. The Kabbalists, the, the Jewish mystics, say everything, the entire world, the entire universe, it's all one, and it's all God. At times, that, like we have been experiencing in recent months, uh, where sometimes it feels like our society has become so fragmented. It has become so difficult for people to talk to each other if they disagree on political issues, on moral issues, on almost anything. We seem to have forgotten that we are all one. We are all part of a oneness that links us all together. And that doesn't mean that we're always going to think alike. Um, there is a, uh, a teaching from the Quran that I have a great deal of respect for and like to mention to people where God says to humanity, I could have created you all alike and chose not to so that you could learn from one another. That's the kind of oneness I'm talking about. So looking at the Shema, reciting it several times a day to myself, um, look, it helps me to look out at the world and see the oneness instead of the fragmentation. And that has been a huge help to me in these difficult times. There's another text from the Talmud, uh, a section called Pirkei Avot, the wisdom of our ancestors. And a rough uh, paraphrase of the Hebrew sounds something like this. Yes, the work is great. And yes, the master of the house, of course, meaning God, is insistent. But you are not expected to complete the task, although neither are you free to desist from it, to neglect it. And remembering that text reminds me, I don't have to carry the entire burden of what's going on in the world on my shoulders. I have all of you. And together, we can each do what little bit we are capable of doing in our lives, in our little corner of the world. And if we all, if each one of us carries our share of the load, it will add up in a very big hurry. I look at what's been going on in this country for the last really four years, five years, uh, through another lens as well. Uh, I am privileged to, at this point, be teaching uh, the US Constitution to undergraduates at CSU. Uh, before I was a rabbi, I was an attorney. 
and um, have always been fascinated by the way the Constitution was put together to create a system that's far from perfect, but builds into itself ways of self-improvement for the system. If only we will remember to do that. And some years ago, I think it was in the 1960s, a, a sociologist at Berkeley named Robert Bella suggested the existence of something that he called American civil religion. It was never intended to replace the traditional religions that many of us carry with us, Judaism or Christianity or Islam or Buddhism or whatever it might be, but to kind of layer over all of those so that we all share in a commonality of being Americans. And it has over the centuries developed a kind of a religious, spiritual element to it. For example, uh, American civil religion has its scriptures, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Emancipation Proclamation. It has its hymns, the Star Spangled Banner, God Bless America, America the Beautiful, and so on. And it has its rituals. One of those rituals is elections. Some of the other rituals are uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, standing for the national anthem at a baseball game. Remember baseball games? They'll be back. Um, and this is something that, according to Professor Bella, Americans, wherever they have been from, have joined in with, again, not replacing the religion that they grew up with, but supplementing it. In the last few years, it has seemed to me that we have lost a lot of what that American civil religion can provide to us as a sense of oneness in America. And particularly in the last year or so during this recent presidential campaign, it has seemed that way more and more to me. In the last week or two, what has helped me to get past my constant, get past to assuage some of my concerns uh, about what's happening with that American civil religion, with the breakdown of the faith that we all share in this system working and allowing us to continue as a democratic society. Um, one of the things that's helped me just in the last couple of weeks is how many people turned out on November 3rd and before that to engage in the greatest sacrament of the American civil religion, the vote for president. Records were set. Records were set even before election day by people who were early voting. That gives me hope. It gives me a reassurance that there are people who still believe in the system, who still believe that America and all of the myths that we buy into together as a society have meaning and will help us survive any particular difficult moment as this has been on into the future. So as a Jew, as an American, as a human being, I look to those sources and enjoy very much hearing what my fellow panel members are offering as well, uh, what helps them get through this time, and look forward to hearing what you, our, our attendees, may have to share in our question and answer period. Thank you, Cassie. Thank you, hello. Uh, the oneness, yes. <laughs> That just resonates so deeply for me in this season. So thank you so much for what you shared. I wanna welcome uh, the Reverend Laurel Leifert. She served at, uh, as a minister at Namaqua Unitarian Church in Loveland since 2011. She was also a lawyer uh, prior to being ordained in 2008 at the first Unitarian Church in Oakland, California where she served for three years. 
Her undergraduate work was in the field of environmental studies. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Reverend, and we welcome you now. Thanks, Kathy. You know, spiritual practice is actually one of my very favorite subjects. So thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel with my esteemed colleagues. You know, I'm passionately committed to spiritual practice in my own life. And I would say I'm almost evangelical about it with my congregation. And this is because of how important spiritual practice has been in my own life for the past 20 years. And now during this challenging time, I find it more vital and essential than ever. Um, you know, I've discovered that most people don't know much about Unitarian Universalism. And if they think they know, it's often not accurate. And so for this reason, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about UU theology. When I first walked into the First Unitarian Church of Oakland, it was in 1990, I had no idea what the theology was, but I still remember how I felt when I walked through the doors and joined that community. It was a feeling of coming home, a sense of belonging. And I've called it the love that will not let me go. So I did leave a 20 year career in law. I went to seminary when I was 50 years old. It was a totally impractical leap of faith, but I, I really felt called to be a UU minister. And now that I know a lot more about UU theology, I can understand why it was that I felt such a spacious sense of belonging in this big tent of Unitarian Universalism. And so tonight to put the UU spiritual practices in context, I think it's important that you understand really what the UU faith is about. So the challenge and the blessing, the blessing and the curse of our UU theology is our pluralism. It's our diversity of belief. So instead of reciting a creed together each Sunday as we begin our worship services, We light a chalice and then we recite together in unison our covenant. Love is the spirit of this church and service its call. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. So instead of a creed, Unitarian Universalism has seven principles that we strive to live by. And a simple way to explain our seven principles is by sharing with you the lyrics of the Chalice Camp song. So it's a song that UU kids sing at summer camp and the Namaqua congregation, we used to sing it in the good old days when we got together in our sanctuary every Sunday, we would sing it together at the end of the service. So here are the words, Unitarian Universalism in a nutshell. It's a blessing we were born and it matters what we do. What we know about God is a piece of the truth. Let the beauty we love be what we do and we don't have to do it alone. So, you know, the established major religions have specific scriptures and sources so Judaism has the Torah, Christians, the Bible, Muslims, the Quran. But this is another way where we are different, a different kind of faith, because the living tradition of Unitarian Universalism draws from six different sources. Direct experience of the world's mystery and wonder. The words and deeds of prophetic people wisdom from the world's religions, Jewish and Christian reminders to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves, humanist teachings which counsel us to heed the guidance of reason, 
and warn us against idolatries of the mind and spirit. And the newest one, spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions, which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. You know, I think when World Wisdoms first invited me to be part of this panel, that the expectation was that I would talk about spiritual practices from a humanist perspective. And so I want to define what humanism is. Um, a good way to explain it is in the words of John Hooper, who is the past president of the UU Humanist Association and is also on the board of directors of the American Humanist Association. Humanists believe in the importance of the lives we live. We wonder and rejoice in the natural world. We welcome the discoveries of science and human reason. And we believe that it is human beings who have the capacity to dismantle injustice and care for one another. So I wonder whether people get confused that RUU congregations include humanists, atheists, agnostics. Why would someone who doesn't believe in God or who does not know whether or not God exists be part of a religious community? Well, did you know that our diverse congregations not only have UU humanists, UU atheists, UU agnostics. We also have UU Christians, UU Jews, Sufis, pagans, pantheists, Buddhists, mystics. So the question might be what holds us together? Well, my theology professor, Rebecca Parker, offered the image of our UU faith as a circle. And it is a boundary that holds some things within the circle, but some things are definitely outside the circle. So I'd like to explain about this circle and the boundaries um, because it may help you understand why and how we can have such a diverse group of seekers. And also it may help you imagine and understand the potential diversity of UU spiritual practices that enrich our lives, that can ground us in both ordinary and extraordinary times, and that let us know we are not alone. So the first circle is you can hold a view that there is no God or that God exists. And addressing Jane, and God can be um, male, female, or not to be so binary, it could be genderless. But anyway, but you cannot hold the view that God is omniscient and omnipotent. God cannot be the all-powerful determiner of everything that happens. So fundamental to UU theology is the idea of free will. Freedom of choice is within our circle. And we, we feel that what we do is we create, we co-create with each other the world that we are making each moment. So this reminds me of the line in the Chalice Camp song, it matters what we do with our lives, what we do with our free will. And then second, you can divine to find salvation, healing, and wholeness in many ways. So that would be within the circle but you cannot hold the view that there will be an ultimate separation of the saved from the damned by which the good are rewarded with eternal bliss and the damned are punished with eternal suffering. So you, you, faith holds that all souls are of worth. So universal salvation is within our circle. It's a blessing we were born. Third, and this one speaks directly to the topic of spiritual practices, you can be devoted to a specific spiritual practice as a Unitarian Universalist, such as Christian prayer, 
or we have a lot of Buddhist meditators, pagan rituals, which I've participated in as well, but you cannot hold the view that there is one true religion that encompasses the exclusive final truth for all times and places. And that includes not Unitarian Universalism. So we believe that revelation is not sealed and that the sacred impulse towards justice, compassion and equity moves in many times and places, including here and now, and in many ways that call to us and that teach us. So diversity, openness to change are within our circle. So this is the line, what each of us knows about God is a piece of the truth. And then finally, you can see this world as tragically flawed or as filled with wondrous gifts or both, but you cannot hold the view that salvation is to be found solely beyond this world in some life after death or a world other than this world other than our blue green planet Earth. So we remain open to mysteries that may be revealed beyond the grave, no one really knows, or in realms beyond which we can know, the invisible dimension that sometimes we can just sense under the surface. But this world, this life, these bodies, are what is sacred. And so I would say the line from the Rumi poem, let the beauty we love be what we do. So that brings us to the last line of the chalice camp song. And I think it, it is the one that means the most to the members of the congregation I serve. You don't have to do it alone. I think all of us wanna have a place to call home. And so together in our congregation, we're working to build that beloved community where there's a place for everyone at the table, where everyone's voice is heard. We seek to be the change that we wanna see. So we have a pluralistic faith and you know we live in an increasingly or maybe always pluralistic world. We don't have to think alike to love alike. And one of my orientations or my most sacred ways to touch the holy is through music. And I'm thinking of one of our songs, which has to do with hope. I'll give you hope when hope is hard to find and I'll bring a song of love and a rose in the winter time. So I wanna end this heady theological discussion by sharing with you two spiritual practices. One is in community and the other one is my personal spiritual practice. The one in community is called a water communion and it's usually done in September and it, it symbolizes the diversity of our sources. So people are invited to bring a small sample of water to the service and then at the appointed time each person or family comes up and pours their water into a common bowl. And at the end of the ceremony, the congregation blesses the bowl filled with this water. And then that becomes what I call our UU holy water, not to be sacrilegious, but we use that in other ceremonies like child dedications. I'll dip a rose into the boiled purified water and touch the brow of the child that we're dedicating ourselves to. Also blessing of the hands, we use it in our healing service around the holidays. And actually Hillel came when we did a building dedication. Namakwa is a young congregation. And we had our first building, our first physical home in 2015. And so when I did the building dedication, I dipped a rose into the holy water and blessed the pulpit and the piano and went down and blessed the pews and the people. And the kids and I were walking with the holy water outdoors out of the doors, blessing the steps, blessing the flowers, and going into the social hall. So that is a significant way that we ritualize and celebrate our diversity and our love and commitment to one another and to our faith. And then the personal spiritual practice that I've had certainly ever since I came here 
is that when I know that there is someone in need, I make a card with their name on it and I put a heart. And so each morning after I get up, I go into my study and I light my, the chalice and some candles. And then I hold some rocks in my hands because my body is alive. And as soon as they're warm, I say, it's a great day to be alive. It's kind of like the country Western version of this is the day we've been given. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. And then I gently touch each of the cards and I close my eyes and I visualize the person or the people and I send them thoughts of love and of healing and of strength. And that is the prayer that I begin my day with. And then I end with some words by John O'Donohue. May I live this day compassionate of heart, clear in word, gracious in awareness, courageous in thought, generous in love. It's a blessing we were born and it matters what we do. What we know about God is a piece of the truth. Let the beauty we love be what we do. And we don't have to do it alone. Thank you. Wow. Uh, thank you, Laurel. It is a blessing we were A little born. theology lesson. <laughs> we know it was a blessing we were born and it matters what we do and we don't have to be alone that was ooh, i read that in deep so, um before i introduce pastor eric i want to remind everyone that after he shares we will have a time for the panelists to engage in a conversation together and then after that a time for questions from all of you and i'm eager to hear from our next speaker so the Reverend and Dr. Eric Smith uh, has served many churches over his three decades of ministry. Presently, he serves as a pastor at Scott United Methodist Church in Denver. Pastor Eric has a rich educational background and experience uh, in dealing with individual and family crisis situations and I know has a lot to share with us. So welcome, uh, Pastor Eric, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for letting me be a part of this panel. And one of the first things I have to lay out as a disclaimer, my thoughts on African-American spirituality are my own. I do not speak for all African-American persons, theologians or pastors. I have never tried to put into one cogent thought a description of my spirituality. So these are some thoughts on my African-American spiritual survival skills during this time of encroaching darkness. This present darkness of COVID and racism wars against not only our physical survival, but our spiritual well-being and our spiritual survival as well. And if I'm going to talk about my spirituality and how it helps me cope in times like these, I have to lay out something that informs my spirituality. One of the main premises of my spirituality revolves around who I am and whose I am. I start with the idea that is not from an African-American spirituality. I believe I am a spiritual being on a human journey. Some people start with the idea that they are human beings on a spiritual journey. In other words, they they practice religion to become more spiritual, and as they become more spiritual, they grow closer to God. I believe I am created in the image of God, that we are created in the image of God, so that I can have a life-giving and life-affirming relationship with God. The image of God that I, that I reflect is a spiritual image. Therefore, I am a spiritual being wrapped up in a human skin, and I'm on a human journey. My human journey <clears throat> is meant to mature me to reflect the spiritual image of God in thought and action. Jesus spoke about our spiritual image being the connection between us and God when he explained the nature of God to the Samaritan woman in John chapter four. In John 
chapter 4, verse 24, Jesus said, God is spirit, and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. All the spiritual disciplines I practice are based on the belief God is spirit, and is not. It, and it is necessary to worship God in spirit and truth. And that informs my prayer life and the spiritual disciplines I practice. That covers who I am, now to whose I am, who gives my life meaning, who claims me. I believe God has a claim on my life because I believe God created humankind so that we are able to have a relationship with God. African-American author James Weldon Johnson starts his classic poem, The Creation, on the premise we were created to be in relationship with God. The poem reflects the description of creation found in Genesis 1 and 2. And the poem starts out, and God stepped out on space, and he looked around and said, I'm lonely. I'll make me a world. After creating the world and the universe in Johnson's mind, God said, I'm still lonely. Then God sat down on the side of a hill where he, where God could think. By a deep wide river, God sat down. With God's head in God's hands, God thought and thought till he thought, I'll make me a human. Up from the bed of the river, God scooped the clay and by the bank of the river, he kneeled him down. And there the great God almighty who lit the sun and fixed it in the sky, who flung the stars to the most far corner of the night, who rounded the earth in the middle of his hands. This great God, like a mammy bending over her baby, kneeled down in the dust, toiling over a lump of clay till he shaped it in his own image. Then into it he blew the breath of life and man became a living soul. Amen, amen. Now, notice in the poem, the creation of humans is described as a sacred and holy thing. God is on God's knees in the process of creating us. And that's a beautiful image of our importance to God. In Genesis 1, God spoke creation into existence. In Genesis chapter 2, God gets God's hands dirty in the creation of humans. Before James Weldon Johnson, King David in a psalm of praise and prayer had the audacity to ask and speculate about our relationship to God. In Psalm 8, verses 3 through 5, the contemporary English version translates David's words this way. I often think of the heavens your hands have made, and of the moon and stars you put in place. And then I ask, why do you care about us humans? Why are you concerned for us weaklings? You made us a little lower than yourself, and you have crowned us with glory and honor. Again, I believe we are meant to be able to relate and communicate with God. That's my prayers or conversations with God. Prayer is, is one of my spiritual survival skills. I cannot hide or withhold anything from God. So my prayer time is a time to tell God about my fears, my anxieties, my needs, my hopes, and my dreams. In my prayers, God is my pastoral counselor, my comforter, the shepherd of my soul. In my prayers, I pray for people with COVID. I pray for change in our country. A prayer is not about turning God into a cosmic Santa Claus by presenting an endless wish list. Another spiritual survival skill in this time of encroaching darkness is my mind. Thus, another scripture that informs my spirituality comes from Romans 12:2 where Paul admonishes us, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. The scripture lays out for me that my mind is a spiritual survival skill in the midst of this encroaching darkness we find ourselves in. When I say this encroaching darkness, I mean, among other things, the darkness of COVID-19 and the darkness of racism. Those two things most affect our physical, mental, and spiritual health. And notice I said are. Even if you are part of the shrinking white majority in this country, your mental and spiritual health is affected 
by racism. Racism is a product of power and fear. The United Methodist Church defines racism as prejudice plus the power to negatively enforce your prejudice. Racism is played out in the fear, real and imagined, the white majority has of being dominated by the growing non-white minor minority. Right now, this country is in a struggle between hope and fear, the battle between the hope for change and the fear of change. So I describe racism and fear as an ever encroaching darkness. Racism is played out in many ways and white power is main, played out in the many ways white power is maintained. Racism reflects a white power differential played out through laws, through access to education and healthcare, and even through religious practices and values. Christianity has been and is still being used to suppress and oppress people of color and women in and outside of the United States. In this country, the misuse of the Bible started with slavery, thinking that religion could be used to pacify enslaved African people. The colonial slave owners taught the Bible to enslaved Africans in worship service that preached and taught the enslaved people were to obey their masters. And the unexpected outcome of letting a black enslaved people get to the Bible and get to Jesus was the growth of a mind altering spirituality. Instead of conforming to the oppression, the Bible transformed their minds. It was Romans 12, two lived out. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I like how the message translation puts it in contemporary English. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God you'll be changed from the inside out, readily re recognizing what God wants from you and quickly responding to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Before the message translation of the Bible came out, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr in a sermon entitled Transformed Nonconformist, based on Romans 12, 2 said, the saving of our world from pending doom will come not through the complacent adjustment of the conforming majority, but through the creative maladjustment of a nonconformist minority. Dr. King went on to say, human salvation lies in the hands of the creatively maladjusted. My African-American spirituality and theology is rooted in the genius and spirituality of a creatively maladjusted enslaved African people. The African-American spirituality first found expression in songs known as the Negro spirituals. And the spirituals were the first true musical art form in America. Spirituals are the root of black gospel, as well as the blues, jazz, rhythm, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, rap, hip hop, and even country. The spirituals expressed the first liberation theologies because they freed the mind to think differently. They taught us how to read the Bible differently. They taught us how to spiritually survive the inhumanity of slavery and racism. The spirituals remind us that singing and music can be a spiritual survival skill. Developing and singing the spirituals was a creative way that enslaved African people had of being creatively maladjusted to their environment. The slave owners wanted the enslaved people from Africa to adjust and conform to slavery. Instead, the spirituals became a source of survival and resistance to the status quo. And the best thing about that was this resistance movement was unbeknownst to the slave owners. They had no idea what was going on. The slave owners had banned the African drum because they feared it would be used to pass messages across a vast distance. But the true African drum carried on in the beat in the chest of enslaved African people. The heartbeat found expression in songs of resistance. W.E. Du Bois in his book, The Souls of Black Folk, 
said through all of the sorrow of the sorrow songs, there breathes a hope, a faith in the ultimate justice of things. He said the slave or sorrow songs expressed a faith that sometime, somewhere, men will judge men by their souls, not by their skin color. The spirituals expressed a different Christianity than that expressed by the slaveholders religion. So right in front of the slave owners, they dared to sing, not everybody talking about heaven is going. And his book, The Negro Spiritual Speaks of Life and Death, Howard Thurman observed, when the master gave the slave his, the master's God for a long time, it meant that it was difficult to disentangle religious experience from slavery sanction. The existence of these songs is in itself a monument to the to one of the most striking instances on record in which a people forged a weapon of offense and defense out of psychological shackle. By some amazing but vastly creative spiritual insight, the slave undertook the redemption of a religion that the master had profaned. The spirituals are rooted in God, Jesus, the Bible, and the experience of an oppressed people. The spirituals became songs that set the mind free and a free mind can never be enslaved or pacified. The spirituals became a source of soul strength for the enslaved people. A spiritual survival skill is one that needs to be developed in this encroaching darkness. And that spiritual survival skill is soul strength. Dr. J Joseph Johnson Jr. describes soul strength this way. Soul is the strength to survive in a hostile environment. Soul is the ability to break through the legal and social conditions which tend to dehumanize and degrade. Soul is the ability to use creatively the destructive powers of a racist society for the development of a tough faith, an undying hope, and an unconquerable love. Soul is the power that has its source in oneself and God. Soul is the power that gives one strength to survive a thousand cavalries and to rise out of the social and ideological swamps into which one has been cast. I like the soul is a power that has its source in oneself and God. With this kind of a soul strength, the spiritual I shall not be moved became a powerful weapon for endurance. I shall not be moved was inspired by Psalm 16 verse eight. I keep the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. In these times of encroaching darkness, music that speaks to my soul helps me beat back the darkness. It's not just the music of the spirituals and the gospels, but modern Christian songs. I have found renewed my strength and renewed my mind. Songs like Josh Groban's, You Raise Me Up, when I am down and oh, my soul so weary. When troubles come and my heart burdens, my heart burdened be. Then I am still and wait here in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to walk on stormy seas. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. So music is one of my spiritual survival skills. And Reverend Maxie Dunham suggested when depression leads someone to lose their song, you sing their song for them or to them until they can sing their song again. And so I leave you with the question, what are the songs that bring, bring you to life and give you soul strength? What are the songs that someone could sing to you if you lose yourself in depression, what are the songs that mean the most to you? Thank you, Pastor Eric. I love that, the, the spirituals, the songs as survival. Carrying on today, it's so important and so moving. I'm just so thankful for your words. We'd like to take about 15 minutes now for you as a panel to simply share any questions or observations that you have about any common themes or sentiments um, in the earlier presentations. 
I'm actually going to start the conversation and I'd like to start by asking Jane Ann and Laurel to begin the dialogue by sharing a little bit more about spiritual practices from your traditions in crisis times. And then I'll let you all take it from there. Hey, Jane, are you? Yeah. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Laura. <laughs> Spiritual practice. Okay. Sorry, Cassie. I was a little distracted because I couldn't get my video on. Spiritual practices from our traditions. Can you say that? In, in times of crises, what does that look like in your world, Jane? In my world, in our world, over at Plymouth UCC. <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of resonance, I felt like, with what uh, in the United Church of Christ, uh, we are known as a progressive Christian community. Um, <laughs> sometimes the UCC is, is known as Unitarians Considering Christ. So we have, so we have some strong uh, ties in our history and in our theology in the sense that we too believe that God is still speaking and we are waiting for um, or not waiting, but we are listening for revelation uh, and um, in having many images for God. Uh, so some of the practices we have are um, centering prayer, um, where, so that's prayer, that's a meditative practice, it's an ancient Christian meditative practice, and um, certainly singing and singing hymns and um, studying with one another, studying theology and studying the Bible, our scriptures and studying um, uh, social justice um, so that we can be uh, Christ's hands and feet in the world. Um, those are some of the connections I, I heard um, uh, with Laurel and with the Unitarians. Um, maybe not specifically Christ's hands and feet, but the hands and feet of love and justice in the world. Laurel. Yeah, well, you know, it's funny about story because one time when I was preaching, I just got this vision that all of us were just sitting under a story tree. And that that's what we did together every Sunday is that we, where we go, that we just were sitting under a story tree telling and sharing our stories. Um, and we always have a time for all ages, you know, with the kids still in the service on Sundays. But, you know, some of the things I'm thinking about, um, you know, we haven't been able to meet in person since March, but we ran in the park and have a group that was doing drumming in our sanctuary and in exchange, since we weren't charging them anything, they did a drumming service in the park. And I think one of the things about Unitarian Universalism is that it's very embodied. And so mm. I'm thinking about what Eric said too, with, about mm. drumming. It's like there's a rhythm to life. There's a rhythm to our heartbeat. There's a rhythm in our breathing. And I think just raising a joyful noise, we were under these trees in the park, was incredibly healing, I think, for all of us. Um, we also have a meditation group that's been eating or meeting outside, and they had a very vivid experience with a tangerine, practicing mindfulness, and then really tasting and smelling, you know, so the sensuousness of life. And, you know, I'm also thinking when we did, a group of us went to a demonstration, um, a Black Lives Matter demonstration along this, the street, one of the main streets in Loveland. And to me, that feels like a form of prayer. So it's like we're there in the name of, of justice and, you know, trying once again to, you know, it's like, I'm sure you know the difference between the world as it should be and the world as it is. So kind of trying to bridge that gap. And I think that um, that can be a very profound sense of um, spiritual practice is of doing something, putting your body on the line. Um, and for me, music is it, 
you know, it's like, I remember the first time when I was singing in the Oakland church and I was standing next to somebody and we were singing a song that almost always made me cry. And I was so embarrassed when a big teardrop dropped on the page of the hymnal. <laughs> then the person standing next to me, a teardrop came from her eyes too. And so then we started kind of leaning into each other. And what I realized is that the hymns are like love songs. Love songs to us, the, the divine, love songs to the community. There's just, you know, one of our biggest images, and I would imagine this is common to all of us, is our interdependent web, that we are all connected right. and that we are all interdependent. And I think that's even more obvious with COVID. And anyway, there, this is a time of profound transformation. And I do not know what I would do without mm -hmm my faith or my community. Laurel, you mentioned the connection between uh, social justice action and spirituality. It reminds me of a story of Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel, who marched with Dr. King at Selma. And when his rabbinic students in New York asked him if he had had time to say his morning prayers that day of the march, he said, I prayed with my feet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Something else that, that really struck me from listening to all of you. Um, what a blessing to, to hear from, from all of us. Um, I talked, one of the things I talked about was the sense of oneness. Uh, oneness among ourselves, oneness with ourselves, with God, um, or the divine in any way that you define that. But we also, in talking, each of us talking about our own traditions, we also, each of us talked about each other's traditions to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. And the traditions of people who are not represented on this panel. We could only squeeze so many people into the evening. Um, reminded me of a thought, I've, I've heard it said that, that some people think that we're each speaking a different language to God. Hmm. And the more I am involved in interfaith uh, activities such as this, uh, I'm convinced we're all speaking the same language, maybe a little bit of a different accent. <laughs> that's a good uh, And that's okay. <laughs> but um, I, I think that uh, as the quote from the Quran that I, that I talked about earlier, uh, I think God would be bored if we were all just one plain vanilla religion. Um, but we each have a corner of the truth. None of us has the whole truth. And I, I find that spiritually refreshing and, and, and it always picks my spirit up in difficult times. To remember that how, bo how boring it would be if we were all telling the same story to god yeah <laughs> or to one another um yeah I, I find that while i have been steeped in the stories of jesus since my since the cradle i understand jesus so much better in dialogue with the stories not only of judaism but of other faiths and um that is such a, a blessing yeah. You know, of course, he he was a Jew, and he was story, a Jew. <laughs> he was I, not a Christian. <laughs> he was not a Christian. Um, I've, I've had some people be shocked when I have said that, uh, but he was. And the stories that I know from the Torah are the stories that he heard from his mother, absolutely, uh, yep. and in the synagogue, and. Uh, no human religion in history has ever come into existence in a vacuum. We have all borrowed from what has been there before us. Mm -hmm. We may change the theology a little bit. We may change the accent a little bit. Mm -hmm. But essentially, we're all, we're, we may be drawing water from different wells, but they're all coming from the same river. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
We're all sitting under the tree of life, that story tree, Laurel said. Yes. Yeah. You know, I wanted to mention to Reverend Smith how much I, I really love Howard Thurman. And I took a class um, at seminary after my parents died. I was very vulnerable at that time. And I cannot tell you how important he became to me. And one night um, we were reading a, his book, Deep River, that was about spirituals. And I was wandering around my house with my guitar and this song just kind of came out of me. And the first words to it were, deep river, who is calling me? Deep, deep river, who is calling me? And then the line that repeated at the end is, here I am, here I am. So, so many things about what you said are just really beautiful. And I also love his, what was a luminous, like I have a personal motto that is, let the luminous light and dazzling darkness sing songs of love through me. And I think I got that luminous phrase from one of, another one of Howard Thurman's books. Yes. So I, uh, what one do of you the think of all this? One of the things, um, one of my favorite quotes about diversity as we talk about how we all tie into each other is diversity is the celebration of difference. And if we could see uh, in each other and celebrate in each other the difference that we each bring. Uh, one of the songs in, in one of our songbooks says that we are each a love song being sung, to be, to be sung, yeah. yes. And uh, I think that's important as we uh, try to heal our nation um, because it, it really is going to be, to, from my way of thinking, it is going to be up to the, the, uh, the mystics and the spiritualists, uh, whatever their faith may be, to try and bring the country together um, mm -hmm. to celebrate who we are, not to be afraid of who we are. Uh, and there's been too much about fear uh, that keeps separating us. I, I am amazed at the power and the ability. He really does have the ability, President Trump does, to tap into everybody's individual fear and bring them all together around fear. Not around faith, but around fear. And mm -hmm. that uh, is something I just, I just feel so sad and angry about. That so many people can be rallied around fear, even if the fear is different for each of them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you that's know. an important, uh, thank you for saying that, Eric. I think that, uh, Pastor Eric, that's uh, how do each of us from our faith traditions with the, the, the gems that are in each of our faith traditions um, that, you know, kind of like glow off of one another. How do, you know, the question for us as people of faith, how do we bring them and let that light and shine so that um, we can we can step a, step out of the fear and see one another's faces um, uh, and that uh, that's a question I've asked myself too if, as being someone who can be very motivated by fear I know that that feeling and so I'm constantly working to say okay is that real? How do we step out of it? Where's the connection with others? I think one of the things that we have to learn to do from each of our religious faiths and within our religious faith is stop trying to be first among equals. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that that, that that really upsets God that we're each trying to be first God's favorite <laughs> or that we are that we have the whole truth and that's an insult to god to think that we have the whole truth about god 
God is way too immense for us to get our arms around mm -hmm. and our thoughts around. Mm -hmm. it, you know, there's an image in that is a universalism image, which is the cathedral of the world, where there's a beautiful cathedral that has all these different stained glass windows, each of them individual colors and shapes, but there's one sun and the sun shines through the various windows. So it's that notion of one light, many windows. And I think, you know, all the windows are equally beautiful. And if someone proclaims that they have the truth, that's not what it's about. Or that we're first, that's not what it's about. And I'm sorry, so you go by Pastor Eric. I called you Eric, then I called you Reverend Smith. But anyway, so you prefer <laughs> Okay. Uh, I, among my colleagues, I am Eric. <laughs> okay. All right. I apologize if I didn't address you the way. You were. You know, speaking of Howard Thurman, one of my very favorite quotes is attributed to him. It's that one, I'm sure you know it, about don't ask what the world needs, ask what makes you come alive. And then go do that because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Alive, yeah. So, I mean, I feel, you know, the sparks in the four of us of, you know, it's like we're alive. I, I think maybe you all like this topic as well as I do. Uh -huh. <laughs> Very much. Yes. I was, uh, I wasn't sure if I was coming through because um the picture of our host was frozen on my screen <laughs> so i was okay i kept looking up to see if i was coming through or not because all i saw was her <laughs> you, you came through we came through we got a, we got it all i loved hearing james weldon johnson again i have before been asked to be the narrator for that for this is kind of embarrassing, but white choirs, but still is such a beautiful uh, message. Uh, and God stepped out on on uh, on earth, or I stepped out and said, "I think I'll make me a world." I, I I think about that often. Thank you for reminding us of that. Uh, thank you all. Um, what thoughtful dialogue uh, that invites us all to reflect and. I know we definitely have some questions from folks who are listening tonight. So, but before I go further on that, I just want to thank you for your sharing and for your listening um, to one another and your insights uh, to one another as well. Um, I love that picture of uh, a light shining through so many windows. I'm going to hold on to that for a while. What we'd like to do now for those who are listening is to invite you uh, to take a break, um, short one, stand up, uh, stretch a little, but also listen to your heart. Uh, what questions or observations uh, in this last hour, hour and a half, um, have struck your heart? Uh, what new desires for spiritual practice may have been awakened in you to be considered? And we're hoping that you'll share some of those questions with us via that question and answer Q&A feature in this webinar. Um, and as we gather those questions, we'll have about 15 minutes for this continued dialogue. There's one of those questions that's already come in and I'll invite our panelists to answer that. And that is, um, so I don't belong to a particular religion. I find it interesting that some of the panelists seem to be saying um, that even people like myself uh, can engage in spiritual practice. Can anyone speak to that? I think that spirituality is a human universal. And I think that it is something in all of us that seeks something greater than the merely human. Because I think that we all understand, we all recognize from looking around us that if the merely human is the best we can do, we're in trouble. <laughs> and so we, we look for 
uh, a higher power. We look for, uh, if, if, you know, some people would say not a higher power necessarily, but perhaps a, a source of strength, um, which is, I think, when, when all of our traditions are at their best, is providing us with a source of um, nourishing our souls, without which we, as Eric said uh, earlier, uh, we are spiritual beings having a human experience, but sometimes the human experience feels like it's going to overcome the spiritual part. And so we have to look for a source to refer to replenish, I think, that spiritual battery that keeps us going. Reminding, being reminded about what Laurel said about um, uh, Unitarian Universalists, all the different circles. Um, I, I wonder if our spirituality, uh, if we don't have a particular faith tradition, is uh, looking for a wider connection and a place of belonging, if that's a part of it, as well as looking for a and if that's where we're looking for a source of strength as well as um, whether you think about a higher power or not. I, I definitely do. It's kind of in my DNA. But, um, but I think it's also looking for that wider, that, that connection with others. Well, I, I think that we human beings are herd animals. We don't do well alone. <laughs> uh, as God noticed in the very beginning of Genesis. It is not good for the human being to be alone. And I think that was one of an impetus for the development of religion in human society to begin with, of, of coming together as community. Um, and I think even, you know, Cassie, as you said, that you, you don't belong to any particular religious tradition, um, but you too look for community. I know that. Um, and, and everybody looks for community somewhere. And I think that's a major part of our spiritual lives is being part of human community. I think another major part of our spiritual life, um, the, the Methodists have uh, a, a belief in prevenient grace, that is God is looking for us before we even know it. Mm -hmm. and, to, and to have a sense of spirituality is for me a sense that God is looking for you. Uh, and how are you going to address that spirituality? There are many traditions to address it. You don't have to follow one or the other, but find, a, find an expression for your spirituality. Religion has been heaped on to many traditions and faith in such a way that it, it, it sometimes becomes a hindrance to, to meeting God rather than... Uh, the, the rituals that enhance our spirituality and our, our union with God. And it has become such a dogma that uh, we are fighting, uh, Christians are fighting among Christians uh, over dogma, over religion. Uh, we're fighting with uh, Jews and, and uh, Islam. They're fighting because they wanna to go to an extreme of the religious faith. That's not, in my belief, what God is after. Um, once again, it's not about being first among equals. It's about finding your, um, where you belong. For me, another thing about spirituality is, it's the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. The thermometer uh, measures the outside temperature a thermostat, an internal thermostat, your spirituality keeps you at a constant temperature within. And mm. so that's, that's one of the differences uh, to really rely on your spirituality, where you connect with God, what keeps you on an even keel, the thermostat within you, I think is important. Yeah, I think that bridges well to uh, one of our questions that's come up, and it is, uh, do you have suggestions on how to start a conversation with 
people who directly oppose our way of thinking. Um, you know, this is, times are tough and how do you engage in some of those more controversial conversations? You know, Krista Tippett talked about um, stepping into the crack. So let's say if the crack is the division between people who are, you know, as, is, as Eric was saying, are driven by fear. And so there's just this separation. One of the ways that you can step into the crack is to ask what hurts? Or maybe even what are you afraid of? You know, I think it's not to, to argue about points that you disagree on, it's to get down to that human level because I think all of us have experienced fear and pain. So connecting, I think, on that level, if you dare, and you, I think, would also have to be vulnerable. So I think you have to kind of put your dukes down and just try to meet one another there. Whenever meeting someone of a different culture or a different faith values than your own, you have to start with common ground. And I think what, you, what you're talking about is common ground. What hurts? Yeah. Yeah. And in that way, we start telling one another our stories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And storytelling is another way of finding common ground. Yep. And yep. When, when we can tell one another our stories, suddenly it's, whoa. Well, I didn't grow up just like you, but I've felt that before. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of the fear uh, that we were talking about earlier, I think particularly Eric was talking about, um, comes from, I think that's, that's also a natural human reaction to the unknown. Mm -hmm. it, it goes back to the time when, you know, what was outside the light from the campfire at night um, was an unknown and threatening. And the world, I think, has become too small for that. Mm -hmm. We can't afford that anymore. And rather than be afraid of what we're not familiar with, um, I think the more that we speak with each other, the more we find out we have in common. Yes, there are differences. But if, as, as Eric has said so beautifully this evening, if we stop trying to be first among equals, if we all accept the idea that we each one of us have a piece of what God is about. And even if we add all of our pieces up, we're not gonna have the whole picture. Uh, if we can all, uh, as the prophet Micah said, walk humbly with our God, um, I, think we, I think we'd lose the fear. I think we'd realize that there's, there's nothing to be afraid of. There, there's there's so much to bring us together. So Halal, I want to keep you on, and I want to hear from other folks too. But I want to. I there's another question, which is, do you ever think that there's uh, a time for spiritual people to withdraw altogether from our political world? No. Oh no. Certainly not in the Jewish tradition. Um, we are not here to escape from the world. Judaism has no history of monasticism. Well, there was one relatively short-lived experiment in, in Jewish monasticism. Uh, it was the Essenes, the people that wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls 2,000 okay. years ago. It, it didn't work out too well. Uh, we <laughs> are. The, tra the tradition of, of the Jewish tradition is we are here to be involved with the world. We are here to be, uh, Jane Ann, you said earlier, to, to be the, the hands and the feet of Christ. I can't say it that way, but to be the hands and the feet of God. Absolutely, uh, yeah. These are God's hands, and mm -hmm. as are yours. And mm -hmm. That's what we're here for. I, I, to withdraw completely? Absolutely not. To withdraw briefly? To recharge the batteries? 
to come together in a, in a, a group like this, uh, to sing songs, to share our traditions, to remind us who we are, yes. But then we have to go back out and as Rabbi Heschel did with Dr. King, pray with our feet. I think Jesus uh, said, wanted to make sure that the, the followers of, of his understood that they were to be the light, the salt, the yeast in the world. And you can't do that with, by withdrawing. Mm -hmm. um, Leontine Kelly, one of our famous black uh, female bishops was asked why she didn't leave the United Methodist Church and go to an African Methodist Episcopal Church and, and other churches that were mostly African, uh, African American, um, where there was no racism, so to speak. She said, you never win a battle by leaving the battlefield. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there may be times of retreat, but you don't absolutely leave. Mm -hmm. And one of our sources is the prophetic lives of people. So, I mean, justice is really at the core of Unitarian Universalism. We've always been engaged with the world. And, you know, I agree with Hillel that you do need, you know, the spiritual practices often are to recharge and to kind of realign yourself with your values. But then you go back out again. And also you join hands with people who are also trying to help make the world more just, more equal, more free. You can always try to leave the world, but the world will not leave you will not leave you alone. Uh, <laughs> most often for those who withdraw, uh, the world impacts them negatively uh, mm -hmm. in their withdrawal. It will not leave them alone. Well, and also it's, you know, it's an illusion that they're alone. Yeah. yeah. We're part of each other, connected. When, yeah, when Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment he quoted Oh, Hillel, I'll probably get it wrong, but uh, he quoted the Torah somewhere, and he said, Many times. and he, he said, um, you know, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, and to love your neighbor as yourself, and you can't love your neighbor if you're disengaged from the world. Um, that's and right. So, you know, it's, it's, for me, that's, a more important trinity than the doctrine of the trinity in the christian church um that because we have god and you can't love your neighbor if you don't love god and you can't love yourself if you don't love god or accept god's love and you can't love your neighbor well if you don't love yourself so it's all goes around in a circle there's another quote another another verse that i often come back to it's from leviticus and it has, God says to Moses, speak to all of the Israelite people, all the people, not just the priests, not just the men, everybody, and say, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And if you say that to, you know, a room full of, of parishioners, they look at you like you're cr crazy, I, you know, me holy, <laughs> we, you know, no, you know. But what does holy mean? In in Hebrew, the word for holy is kadosh. And at its most basic, that word is not a religious word. It simply means something that's set aside from other things that look just like it for a particular purpose. For example, the very first thing in the Bible that's called holy is the Sabbath day. And if you're not observing a Sabbath day, and it looks exactly like the other six days of the week. Mm -hmm. So how do we be holy? We set ourselves aside, not from other people and not from society, but from the mundane, from the, we, we all have had days where we have sleepwalked through our daily routine, 
It, it's a very human thing to do. I don't think a human being has ever existed as capable of, of never doing that. But I think one of the great things about religious traditions, uh, whether they're 4,000 years old like mine or a hundred and some years old like Laurel's, um, is that we, this is, we, we have these rituals that we've practiced, that we know have fed people before us and that we can benefit from. And we can take those and, and as Laurel, as you were saying, and take, go back out into the world and be holy by doing God's work, by doing the work of reminding people that we are all created in the divine image, of reminding people, each other, um, that uh, we have so much in common. I noticed that one of the other questions, I, I don't remember if any of our panel uh, had said that they wanted to directly respond to it, but I noticed one of the other questions that was asked uh, was, let me see if I could find it here. Um, About a labyrinth? Well, I'd, that's not our tradition, so I was going to leave that to somebody else. Okay. <laughs> um, how do how do Marianne said she wanted to respond to this, but I, I'm going to I'm going to say something about it also. Uh, and, and this is from our friend David Cloyd. Any suggestions on how to start conversation with those who directly oppose our in quotes way of thinking? Um, Eric, I think you said it a little while ago. Let's find what we have in common. And we all have pain in common. We all have concerns. We all have worries. We all have uh, fears. Let's talk about those fears. We may have different solutions to it. And maybe some of my ideas won't work for you. And maybe some of your ideas won't work for me. But I'll bet you if enough of us tell, share our ideas about how to help each other get past our pain. We're going to find something that will help us do that together. Don't emphasize the differences. Let's emphasize the commonalities. And that'll make working on the differences that much easier. You know, and I think a an important skill like if you ask someone what hurts and what you're afraid of or whatever is to develop the skill of deep listening i think that's a lot of what we do and what we're doing now in small groups is really being still and listening to someone and sometimes not even just listening on the surface there's an image i like of the river beneath the river Yeah. There's there's another saying that uh, that I think it's from the prayer of Saint Francis or seek to understand before uh, seeking to be understood. Oh right. Maybe, maybe that comes from Franklin Covey. I don't remember where I got it from. Oh, I'm sorry she's getting mixed up after a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. understand rather than to be understood you are yeah that's it yeah. yeah i'd like to say something to the person that asked about the the labyrinth because it kind of connects to should we withdraw from the world my understanding of walking the labyrinth and i have walked the labyrinth and i enjoy walking the labyrinth uh is that you as you go towards the center the center is the heart of god you mm -hmm. can't stay there you have to go back out into the world so you take your peace back out into the world with you. Uh, mm -hmm. Cannot stay uh, at the heart, at the center in the heart of God. That's the whole purpose of the labyrinth, to get there and then to go back out into the world to share it, to share that love, to share that insight, those understand. So yes, labyrinth is a, is a good, uh, for me, is, it is a good, important <clears throat> spiritual practice if you can find a labyrinth. Mm -hmm. We have, we yeah, have we a have. labyrinth and a memorial garden in in um, at Plymouth, and all are welcome to come. And you just 
if you're coming off a prospect, just look behind the big spruce trees and there's a labyrinth back there that people are welcome to use. And the other beautiful thing about a labyrinth in these crazy times is you can't get lost. Yeah. <laughs> you can't get lost on the labyrinth. You'll, it'll take you to the center and then you'll be there in that heart of God and then it'll take you back out. Do you have one in Loveland too, um, Laurel? Well, I, I think there's one at Pathways Hospice, which I don't know if yes, that's uh -huh. between Fort Collins and Loveland. Yeah. In fact, that was, we are next to a park. And one of my fantasies when we first moved into our building is that we would get permission from the city to create a labyrinth in the park. Yeah, I really, I love labyrinths. And you know, I always like images where there's not a straight line, because that's certainly what my life has been like, is much more labyrinthian than A to B. And also sometimes I have felt like, oh my gosh, did I screw up? I think I might, I might be lost. And then you just keep going and yeah. you aren't. So I think that's also a, a facet of it that I enjoy. That mm -hmm. is a spiritual practice. That's what we do in our lives. You, your comment about being lost uh, reminds me of a story of the the person who's who's lost in the woods and he's been wandering for days and he can't find his way out and he never sees anybody else and finally after days he comes across another person who's also lost in the woods <laughs> and the first person goes to the the person he's met he says oh i'm so glad to see you i've been alone all these days i've been trying to find my way out of the woods and I haven't found anything. Can you show me how to get out of these woods? And the second person says, no, I'm lost too. But now we can look for the way out together. Right. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I um, am so grateful for all of your thoughts and uh, appreciate this conversation and the dialogue. Uh, I'm yeah, uh, what Hillel just said just brings me back um, to uh, what was shared er earlier with Laurel of it's a blessing we're born, it matters what we do, and that we don't have to do it alone. Um, we right. find a way out of this maze. So thank you all for sharing <laughs> so sincerely and profoundly tonight. Uh, this has just been so moving. Your willingness to share has definitely strengthened all of us and reminded us that we don't have to do it alone. I'm going to hand the mic, the mic back over to Mary Ann, um, who's going to close tonight's session. Thanks, Cassie. Thank Thanks, you, Cassie. Everybody. And thank you, panel, for your vulnerable and courageous sharing of this experience this evening as we join together to truly find our way out of this moment. As we wrap up, I'd like to call your attention to some other wonderful events that we are planning on bringing your way this year. As I mentioned earlier, as I, as I mentioned earlier, uh, two weeks from tonight, you're warmly welcome to join us for a follow-up conversation uh, with Rabbi Hillel and volunteer Mary McDonald. Uh, they would very much like to hear your reflections and questions within the warmth of a smaller group sharing. And so if you if click you on the link, that we'll be showing in the chat right now. Um, and also you can always check on our website for this. You will receive an email invitation inviting you to that Zoom event. So we hope to see you December 2nd. And looking ahead for the long cold months ahead, we're delighted to be able to share two very special types of sessions. Um, one of them, all of them focusing on spiritual practices that can sustain us uh, from various communal and personal sources. Our January event and February events are personal inspiration events. The Book of Hours was a way chosen by many during the varied crisis of the Middle Ages, particularly plague times, to cope. Today that practice is enjoying a reawakening. This immersive art event in January, uh, which will be held over four Sunday afternoons, will allow each participant to create their own contemporary Book of Hours. 
the February event, writing a spiritual autobiography, forming the link between meaningful experience and caring action in a time of crisis on Sunday, the 21st of February, will help you to reflect on your sustaining core values and where they may be leading you. Both of these are slightly different from our ordinary events in that they are fundraising events for our World Wisdoms Project. The artists are donating their talents and times in great hope for the continuance of World Wisdoms Project. Thus, there is a cost attached to each and there is a registration limit. So register soon. Apple opportunity will exist for personal sharing in each one of those events, as well as the sharing of your own creation. Click on the link for further registration information. This might be a good Christmas gift for somebody special out there. On March the 4th, we will be back in our regular Zoom format to present part two of what we began tonight. You Do What? Spiritual Practice in a Time of Crisis will feature panelists from the Christian, Quaker, Buddhist, Hindu, and Native traditions. Finally, we'll be closing out our year on April 25th with the event which was rescheduled from March of 2020, Awe, Ethics, and River Conservation. It will feature the reflections of CSU professors Kurt Fausch and Katie McShane. Continue to check our website for more details. Very importantly, please don't forget to consider supporting our ongoing need in world wisdoms. As I said earlier, we are totally dependent on your generosity for our long-term survival. Click on any one of the ways that are listed here for a secure donation. Stay current with us by signing up on any of our multiple uh, media sites. One of, our week one of the best ways to do that is our weekly email, our MailChimp, and it a, a personal way to keep in touch with what's going on. So consider signing up for that. That can be done on our website and various other media opportunities. And finally, and most importantly, your feedback after each one of these events, and I noticed some feedback already in the Q&A and in the chat, please help us to know how to formulate our future programs and click on the link that's here uh, to give us feedback immediately or click on the email that you'll receive tomorrow to do the same. We really want to hear from you. For, for those of you that respond within 48 hours from now, we will enter you into a drawing for a $25 gift certificate for local dining and carry out. Thank you all. And thank you once again to our panels for your wonderful sharing with us this evening. May the rest of the night be filled with peace. Thank you and good night. Here.